All right, so this is the EKG and cardiovascular testing section of the NHA book. If you're following along with the book, um, this is chapter 13. I am Jose Rivera, I'm an internal medicine resident. And well, let's begin. All right, so I'm gonna be using two resources, the NHA uh, study guide, which I recommend you get. Um, and then I'm also gonna be using the Pearson's Comprehensive Medical Assisting book, which is uh, the book we use at the school I used to teach at. Right, so we have to start off with what is the electrocardiogram, right? And well, let's break that down. Um, electro, meaning electricity, right? Cardio, meaning heart, and then gram, meaning, uh, in this case, recording. So the word itself literally means uh, a recording of the electrical activity of the heart. The way I usually explain it to a patient is uh, it's an electrical picture of the heart, okay? Um, and what does it do? It detects arrhythmias and just basically heart problems. Now, you might hear it referred to as either an ECG or an EKG. Um, they both mean the same thing. And we'll, we use pretty standard equipment uh, in order to take, um, you know, the image. Okay, so when you're gonna do the procedure on a patient, it's really important that you use two identifiers, right? What does that mean? Well, the most common ones are gonna be name and date of birth. Okay, now it's really important that you ask the patient, what is your name? and not confirm if that makes any sense so you want to say could you please tell me your name as opposed to saying is your name john smith um and that's just proper technique same thing with the date of birth you want to ask what is your date of birth you don't want to say is your date of birth uh october 10th 1998 no you want to ask that's really important now another thing you want to do is you want to explain the procedure and you always want to introduce yourself so you want to say something like, hi, my name is Jose Rivera and I'm the medical assistant. I'm going to be taking an electrocardiogram or an EKG. An EKG is an electrical activity of your heart. What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be placing a bunch of wires on your chest, uh, which might take a while. Um, and then I'm going to be taking the image itself. Ask that you please undress from the waist up. Do you have any questions for me? You always want to, you always want to finish asking the patient if they have any questions. So because of where the electrodes go, you always want to protect the patient's privacy. And you know, it can be tricky at times, but once you start doing these procedures more and more often, then you kind of find little ways of doing it. Um, it is not always necessary for the patient to completely disrobe, you know, obviously they don't have to take like their pants off, but you do want to have access to their ankles. So they might have to roll up their pants. If they have any jewelry that's going to be touching the electrode, you want to make sure that they take it off because if they have it on, it's going to create interference. And then this this one's really important. They should have no electrical devices on them because then that would also create an interference, uh, also known as artifacts. That's going to mess up your whole image and you're going to have to retake it. All right, when it comes to the anatomy of the heart, it's really important that when we're viewing an anatomical picture, you're always placing the image in the anatomical position. So in this case, this would be right and this would be left. And we're going to divide the heart itself into four chambers. You're going to have two chambers on top and two chambers on the bottom. The chambers on top are called the atria. So this could get a little confusing, but it's really not that hard. So atrium means one. Atria is plural. So the atria, more than one. Atrium for just one. So we're going to have a right atrium and a left atrium. And those will be the chambers on top. The chambers on the bottom are called the ventricles. And we're going to have a right ventricle and a left ventricle. Now let's talk about how the blood flows. And you can see here on the little arrows how it's flowing. Blood is going to go first into the right atrium through the superior and the inferior vena cava into the right atrium. From here, it's going to go down into the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, it's going to go out through the pulmonary trunk, the pulmonary arteries, into the lungs where it's going to get oxygen. Once it has received oxygen, it's going to go back to the heart through the pulmonary veins into the left atrium. From the left atrium, it's going to go down into the left ventricle, and then from the left ventricle, it's going to go out through the aorta into the body. Okay? Now, I'm going to explain it again. Uh, it's just important anatomy, and it's just important for you to really understand sort of the heart. Again, blood is going to flow the superior and inferior vena cava into the right atrium, from the right atrium down into the right ventricle, from the right ventricle out to the pulmonary trunk, pulmonary arteries, it's going to go into the lung to get oxygen, 
Once it gets oxygen, it's going to go back into the heart through the pulmonary veins, into the left atrium, from the left atrium down into the left ventricle, and then from the left ventricle out through the aorta into the body. Now, there are doors in between the chambers prevent blood from flowing back. So for example, in between the right atrium and the right ventricle, there is a door right here. It's called a valve, and this is the tricuspid valve. And this is going to make blood flow only in one direction. It does not allow the blood to go back. So remember that the tricuspid valve is located on the right side of the heart. In between the ventricle and the pulmonary trunk, there's another valve right here. And this one is called the pulmonic valve. And again, this one's going to prevent, it's going to allow blood to flow in one direction, but it's not going to allow it to go back. Right? And we don't want it to go back, so, so that's the pulmonic valve. On the left side of the heart, we're going to have another door right here, another valve, and it's going to be between the left atrium and the left ventricle. And this is the bicuspid valve, also known as the mitral valve. Okay, and again, this one's going to allow the blood to come this way, but not for it to go back into the atrium. And last but not least, between the ventricle and the aorta, we have another valve right here. It's called the aortic valve. And the aortic valve is going to allow blood to flow from the, atri from the ventricle out into the aorta, but not back. And we don't want it to go back. Make sure you know your valves. Valves are really important. Uh, I do want to mention that the blood does not go, you know, section by section. It goes to kind of two sections at a time. So as you can see on this image, both atria are filled with blood at the same time, right? And then both ventricles are filled with blood at the same time. So it's not like blood here first, then here, then over here, then come here, here, no. That's not exactly how it happens. Both the atria on top get filled when they are both relaxed, and then both ventricles get filled when they're both relaxed, right? So basically, when the atria are in systole, the ventricles are in diastole. When the ventricles are in, in systole, the atria are in, in diastole. We're going to have a special set of cells within the myocardium, which is the muscle of the heart, that's going to allow for electrical activity. Now, it's not actual electricity that's running through the heart. It is a, an exchanging of electrolytes, of ions, that change the positivity and negativity of the cells. We're not going to get too into detail, but for basic understanding, it's referred to as electricity. And now we're going to talk about the electrical activity of the heart. This is insanely important, and I'm pretty sure you're going to be tested on it because it's just that important. Now, you need to know that this set of cells right here is called the SA node. And that stands for signal atrial. The SA node. This one is also known as the pacemaker of the heart. Y'all heard of people getting pacemakers, artificial pacemakers. Well, the heart already has one in it, and it's called the SA node. Okay, and this is pretty much where the heart begins its heartbeat. Um, the heart is autonomic, meaning that it on its own will beat, and the signal that makes it beat starts off in the SA node. And the SA node is located in the right atrium. The SA node will send the signal for both atria to contract, as you can see right here. You, you can see how it sends the signal and then they both contract. All right, now, the SA node is gonna send a signal down into the AV node. This one makes sense, the name makes sense, because it is between the atria and the ventricle. And both the SA node and the AV node are both located in what atrium? The right atrium. So the SA node sends the signal to the AV node, atria contract. And then it waits here. As you can see, it waits on the AV node for a little bit. And it has to wait there. Because if it sends the signal all the way down, then the whole heart contracts and it wouldn't make any sense. So it holds here in the AV node a little bit. So the atria contract. And then once they contract, the AV node sends the signal down through the rest of the heart for the ventricles to contract. And all these have names. Now you don't really need to know the names of the whole thing, but just kind of mentioning. The part over here is called the bundle of his. Then you have the left and right bundle branches, and then you have the Brekinji fibers. You don't need to know all those things, but make sure you know the location of the SA node and the location of the AV node, both of them located on the right atrium. All right, now before we move on, I do want to mention this, and this is just important, and these are the coronary arteries. The coronary arteries are going to be the arteries that actually supply oxygen to the heart itself. 
Okay, they come off of the aorta. You can see the aorta right here. Right? <clears throat> and we have two main ones, a right coronary and a left coronary. So when there's a blockage, let's say there's a blockage right here, um, then obviously oxygen is not flowing to this area, and then this area starts to die. And that's what we call a heart attack, a myocardial infarction. And I do want to mention that a heart attack is different from a cardiac arrest. A cardiac arrest is when the heart stops beating for whatever reason. A heart attack is when there's a plug in the coronary artery, blood does not flow to the area that it needs to go, and then there's a heart attack. Most EKGs are going to print 12 leads at once. Now I do want to mention something here real quick. Real quick. Um, are you going to hear that people interchange the words leads and electrodes? Technically the electrode is the wire and the lead is whatever's printed on the image, but you'll hear most people just refer to the cables as leads and not so much electrodes, but just know the difference. I don't think it's important for the test, but just general knowledge. And it's going to print 12 leads, so when you place the 10 electrodes on the patient's chest and arms and legs, uh, you're going to get 12 leads. Now I'm going to talk about specifically what each one of these means. So just now you can get an image that looks like this where all 12 leads are printed at once. You can get something like this where the leads are printed kind of by threes. And then you can also just get a single where this will be a long strip of paper and then the leads are printed uh, one by one. My favorite is this one. All right. so. This is really important. This is something you really, really need to know. Um, and it's really only for testing purposes because in the real world, you kind of place them as close as possible to this. And you don't actually have to regurgitate the exact um, verbiage that's used to um, describe the location of these leads, of these electrodes. But for the testing purposes, you're gonna have to know them. So first off, let's start with the very, very easy ones. And these are gonna be the limb leads. You can have a right arm, a left arm, a right leg, and a left leg. Now, technically, you can put these anywhere on the arm. As long as it's a, it's a nice, fleshy area, you can put it. So you'll see some people put it maybe on the bicep. Some people will put it on the hand, on the forearm. Those you can place anywhere, really. Um, I personally, I like to put them up on the chest, uh, about the shoulder area. That's kind of my favorite section. So that's for the right arm and the left arm. For the right leg and the left leg, Again, you can kind of place them anywhere along the leg. Uh, some people like the thigh, um, you know, the uh, leg, the actual foot. Um, I personally, I prefer on the lower part of the abdomen for both the right leg and the left leg. Now, if a person has an amputation, you want to place, let's say they have a BKA or below the knee amputation, you would place it right above the knee and you want to make sure you place both electrodes at the same level. So what you don't want to do is you don't want to place an electrode here and another electrode here. You want to place both of them on the same level, whether it be on the arms or the lower abdomen. Again, I prefer placing them on the lower abdomen and having to place them all the way up here. That way all my leads are right here on this area. So those are the easy ones. Again, right arm or left arm a right leg and a left leg. Okay, now let's talk about the precordial leads. And remember, the other ones are limb leads. The precordial leads, there's gonna be six of them. And we'll start off one by one. Now they all have colors, as you can see, they all have colors, and so sometimes you might see that the cable itself, maybe, the, uh, maybe because after so much use, the actual letters might fade away, but the colors usually stay. Um, I don't think it's really important for you to know the colors, Oh, you like no, at least not the precordial. The limb leads probably, uh, but the precordial ones not so much. But anyway, let's start off with the numbers. So first one is going to be V1. V1 is going to go on the fourth intercostal space to the right of the sternum. So what are the intercostal spaces? Right, these right here, these are your ribs. The space in between the ribs are called the intercostal spaces. Makes sense, right? Enter between cost, costal ribs. So, one, two, three, four. So it goes on the fourth intercostal space on the right side of the sternum. So this is the sternum, right? All of this is the sternum. It's gonna go on the right side of the sternum. So again, remember this is right and this is left. Now you might also see right peristernal, which basically means next to the sternum. So the V1 goes on the fourth intercostal space, right peristernal line. 
Now, what does parasternal mean? Well, there are imaginary lines. So if it's right next to the sternum, that is the parasternal line. The next one, V2. V2 is going to go on the same section, basically, but on the left side of the heart. Right? So that would be the first intercostal space, the second intercostal space, the third, and then the fourth intercostal space. Now, if you want to use landmarks, a lot of times you can use the nipples as landmarks. Now, it's not a great landmark because, you know, with women, it could not be the fourth intercostal space. Uh, but if you have a, a thin male, the nipples are almost always going to be more or less at about the level of the fourth intercostal space. It's not the best landmark, but it's something to go by. Now, we usually skip V3 and we go to V4. V4 is going to go on the fifth intercostal space, right, they should say right, right here, right mid clavicular line. Well, obviously on the Now, V4 is going to go on the fifth intercostal space, left mid clavicular line. Um, so there should be. So obviously, this is the clavicle, right? And the mid clavicular line would be an imaginary line. And the mid clavicular line would be an imaginary line that you make in the middle of the clavicle, you go all the way down into that fifth intercostal space. If you're using a landmark, it's about more or less right beneath the nipple. Not the best thing to use, but you know, it helps. Once we know that V4 goes on the fifth intercostal space left mid clavicular line, then we place V3 in between. Then we place V3 in between V2 and V4. So V3 doesn't have a specific place, it just goes between V2 and V4. Now V5. V5 is going to go on the fifth intercostal space, left anterior axillary line. Now this is going to be a little hard, but there are on the axilla. Now it's going to be a little, <clears throat> now it's going to be a little bit hard, but in the axilla you have three imaginary lines. Pretty much where the crease begins you can have the anterior axillary line. In between, right in the middle of the axilla, you can have the mid axillary line. And then on the back of the axilla, you can have the posterior axillary line. So V5 is going to go on the fifth intercostal space, left anterior axillary line. And then V6 is going to go on the fifth intercostal space, left mid axillary line okay so let's talk about these again so these are the precordial leads v1 it's going to go on the fifth intercostal space left it's going to go on the fifth intercostal space right parasternal line v2 so let's talk about these again so v1 is going to go on the fourth intercostal space right parasternal line v2 it's going to go on the left intercostal V2 is going to go on the fifth intercostal space, right parasternal line. V2 is going to go on the fifth. V2 is going to go on the fifth intercostal space, left parasternal line. V2 is going to go on the fourth intercostal space, left parasternal line. If you want to use landmarks, you can remember the nipples would be the landmarks here. We skip V3. We go to V4. V4 is going to go on the fifth intercostal space. We're only using two numbers, four and five. On the fifth intercostal space, mid clavicular line. You go on the clavicle, you find the midpoint, you go all the way down to the fifth intercostal space. And again, more or less, that's below the nipple. V3 goes between V2 and V4. V5 is going to go on the fifth intercostal space, anterior axillary line. And then V6 is going to go on the fifth intercostal space, mid axillary line. There's really no way of Really, this is one of those things you just have to memorize. Um, it's not that hard, just remember. It's really not that hard. Remember, there's only there's only two numbers we're using, four and five. There's only one that's gonna go on the right side, which is V1. There's only one on the left side that's gonna stay on the fourth intercostal space, which is V2. And then the rest are gonna be on the fifth intercostal space on the left side, with the exception of V3, which goes in the middle of V2 and V4. Now that is a little confusing. 
I would recommend that you rewatch that, reread it, just sit down and try to memorize it because that's probably one of the hardest things about this test. And they could ask you something as easy as, you know, which electrode goes on the fifth intercostal space left mid axillary line? And you should just know, well, that's V5. Which electrode goes on the fourth intercostal space of the right side of the sternum? And well, you should just know that that's V1, so on and so forth. Okay, now I know this slide has a lot of words, right? But if there's anything you're going to take out of this slide, are two things. Now these are things you need to know. One, the speed that the paper prints is 25 millimeters per second. Memorize that number. The paper speed prints at 25 millimeters per second. The normal amplitude is 10 millimeters for one millivolt. Make sure you know that. Now I'm gonna explain this, but make sure you know those. The speed prints at 25 millimeters per second and the amplitude or gain, this is also called sometimes the gain is 10 millimeters for one millivolt. All right, now I'm gonna explain this. First of all, what does this mean? Normal speed of 25 millimeters per second. The EKG is printed on a special piece of paper which looks something like this. Here it is better. So, speed. 25 millimeters per second. What does that mean? It means that when the paper is printing, these squares, you're going to see that the EKG paper has big squares, and inside those big squares are going to be these little squares. These little squares, which are these right here, are one millimeter, both on the x-axis and on the y-axis. They are one millimeter because they are squares. So. The speed of the print of the machine should be 25 millimeters per second. That means that in one second you should print one, two, three, four, five, and then another five, another five, another five, so on and so forth. In one second you print 25 of these little squares. That's what the speed means. Okay. Now the gain or amplitude. Now. Now the gain or amplitude. It's ten millimeters per millivolt. Okay. Again, we are measuring it in electricity. These are millivolts, which are almost, you know, very, very small numbers. <clears throat> so what does this mean? This means that one millivolt you need to have ten millimeters. So this is one, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So the amplitude is measured this way. And you're going to see that the beginning of the EKG usually has something like this. And so inside of the gain, you should have ten little squares. And you can think of the gain or the amplitude as sort of the zoom in and zoom out feature of the EKG machine. The speed tells how fast it's printing, and then the gain or amplitude shows sort of how how much you've zoomed in or zoomed out. It's kind of the simplified version of what that means. Okay. Now, if the paper, this is important, if the paper is printing at 25 millimeters per second, then each one of these squares is going to equal a specific amount of time. Okay. And you can see it right here. So if it's printing at 25 millimeters per second, one little square is going to measure in time 0 0.04 seconds. All right. So this is 0 0.04. 0 0.04, 0 0.04, 0 0.04, right? And if you add that up, that should equal 0.20 seconds. Now, why is that important? Because we're going to tell how, now why is that important? Because we're going to tell the um, heart rate 
it's important for you to know this and I'm, I'm going to talk about that later okay so make sure you know that the speed is 25 millimeters per second make sure that the gain or amplitude should be 10 millimeters per millivolt and make sure that you know that one little square equals 0 0.04 seconds and one big square equals 0.20 seconds so if you want to get to one second you're going to need five of these big squares so this is one two three four five so that these five would be one second assuming you're printing again at 25 millimeters per second this is really important make sure you know these numbers now the EKG is going to print on either a graph matrix which is you know the one on top or you can print on a dot matrix it doesn't matter they're both the same um, you know and when it comes to a dot matrix when it comes to a dot matrix uh, just make sure that like you would kind of fill in the imaginary lines right here in order to have the actual squares that you have here but they're the same thing so i do want to mention it's a different day and on the background you might hear the dog snoring um which is kind of ignoring if anything hopefully it's a little soothing okay so performing the ekg so whenever you're going to do the ekg you want to make sure that the patient is not wearing any sort of substance on them okay uh, and this is lotions, powders, oils. If they are wearing something, you usually want to use alcohol wipes to try to wipe it down. If you don't, then uh, you're going to notice that the patient, the, the electrodes, the patches you're actually going to apply will just kind of come off. Uh, and this also includes if the patient is sweaty, uh, same thing, they're going to come off. So you want to make sure you kind of rub them down with a little bit of alcohol. Whenever you do place the electrodes, you always want to place them in the fleshy areas. You want to kind of avoid the bony prominences. Okay, so let's talk about the actual waves. But first, let's look at this image right here. Okay, so we already talked about the squares. Hopefully, you've understood that. If, if you still have questions, you know, go back, review it. But now let's talk about this line. Okay, when the EKG prints, it should print a line perpendicular to the bottom of the paper, right? And this line is called the isoelectric line. The isoelectric line. Anything that goes above that line we call that a positive deflection anything that is below that line is a negative deflection so let's talk about the actual waves there's going to be three major ones that you need to know and that's going to be the p wave the qrs wave or the qrs complex i actually prefer qrs complex and the t wave now let's talk about what each one of these means okay earlier we talked about the sa note the AV node, and I told you that there was a signal that would go down, right, from the SA node to the AV node, and then from the AV node down through the bundle of his, the right and left bundle branches, and then the Purkinje fibers. Well, this signal has a name, and it's called depolarization, okay? Depolarization is the same as contraction, or the same as systole. Now, this is not entirely true, um, but we're kind of going to use them interchangeably, uh, but there is a difference okay so we have the three waves right we have the p wave the qrs complex and the t wave well on the sa node since the signal down to the av node we call that depolarization and when that depolarization occurs we get a, a bump on that isoelectric line and we call that a p wave so the p wave means atrial depolarization okay now for the context of this test we're going to use depolarization and contraction to mean the same thing. There's a slight difference, but we're not gonna worry about that right now. Okay, so again, the SE node sends the signal down to the AV node, it depolarizes, and so we get the P wave. So the P wave means atrial depolarization, which means atrial contraction, uh, atrial systole. When the atria contract, we get a P wave. Now, if you look at the size of the atria, compared to the size of the ventricles, you're gonna see that the atria are much smaller than the ventricles and they also have much less muscle mass. So obviously when the ventricles contract, we're gonna get a much bigger spike and we call that the QRS complex. So when the AV node sends the signal down through the bundle of his, the left and right bundle branches and the Purkinje fibers, we get the QRS complex, just this right here. So again, the QRS complex means ventricular 
depolarization or ventricular contraction. While this is occurring, the atria are going to relax. We don't get to see that on the EKG because the ventricles are masking the atria relaxing. So we don't see a wave when the atria relax. But because the ventricles are so big, they have so much muscle mass, when they relax, we get to see another wave. And that is the T wave. So the T wave is going to be ventricular repolarization. Okay, focus on that re. Repolarization or relaxation. So the T wave means ventricular repolarization when the ventricles relax, you get that T wave. So P wave, atrial contract, right? Atrial depolarization. QRS complex, ventricles contract. Vent uh, ventricular depolarization. T wave, ventricles now are going to relax. Ventricular repolarization, ventricular relaxation. So, so this right here, the PQRST, that is one cardiac cycle. Now, some EKGs, and maybe even on some patients, this is pretty rare. You might see something called a U-wave. It's not part of your regular cardiac cycle. You might see it, you might not see it. But the U-wave is going to be a repolarization of the Purkinje fibers. Uh, and I've also been described as a sort of relaxation of a specific tissue in the heart called the coordinate tendinae. Uh, you don't need to know it really, unless you're really going for that EKG certification. It's just kind of an extra thing. Focus on, make sure you know the P, the QRS, and the T. Those are what really, really matter. Now, there are other parts of the EKG that you should be aware of. Uh, for the MA test, I don't think they're going to test you on these, with maybe the, the exception of one of these, um, but they're not as important. Uh, we're going to have segments and intervals. Intervals, this right here, are going to contain two things. So, for example, the PR interval going to be from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the Q wave. It's kind of confusing uh, because you would think it'd be called the BQ wave, but the Q wave is not always there. Actually, you don't want to see a Q wave. Uh, again, we're getting, we are getting a little bit more into detail. A Q wave is actually a bad thing. You don't want to see a Q wave. Um, if, if you do see one, you want to see a small one. Now, you know, kind of forget that, just QRS complex. Now, the QT interval is going to be from the beginning of the Q to the end of the T. So remember, intervals contain two waves. Now, really, the one that you should focus on, and the one I would say you should know, is the ST segment. A segment is going to be a section in between two waves. So remember, an interval is usually from the beginning of one wave to the start of another wave or the end of another wave, while a segment is the section between specific waves. So for example, the PR segment is the section of where the P ends and the uh, Q begins. The ST segment is where the S ends and the T begins. This is the important one because the ST segment is how doctors can determine if the patient is having a heart attack, right? A myocardial infarction, an MI. Now you might hear the word STEMI. And a STEMI is an ST elevation myocardial infarction. So it is when this ST segment is kind of up like this. Uh, and so there's an elevation of the ST segment. So we call that a STEMI, which is a heart attack, a myocardial infarction. Now, that's not always the case. Sometimes you have something called a non-STEMI. And in a non-STEMI, this person is having a heart attack, but the ST wave is normal, right? And that's a different type of heart attack. Just make sure you know that the ST segment can determine whether the patient is having a heart attack or not. The medical term for heart attack is myocardial infarction. On an EKG, we see a heart attack as a STEMI. Um, and then a non-STEMI is not really seen through the EKG, but we order certain tests called cardiac troponins. Um, and if those are elevated, they can tell us if the patient is having a heart attack. So here it is again. Remember, P wave, right? Atrial depolarization. What does depolarization mean? It is the same as contraction or systole, right? Again, if we really want to get technical, that's not 100% true, but for um, testing purposes, we're going to consider it. The next one, QRS complex. This is ventricular depolarization, right? So when those ventricles contract, we see that big QRS complex. When those ventricles relax, we're going to see the T wave, which is ventricular repolarization. Make sure you know these. You need to know. You need to just, when somebody asks you, you should just know. You shouldn't even have to think about it. You should just know P. Atrial depolarization, QRS, ventricular depolarization, D, ventricular repolarization, just now. And again, what determines a heart attack is this section right here called the ST 
segment, which can determine an MI, which could be either a STEMI, which we can see on a heart attack, right? ST elevation myocardial infarction, or a non-STEMI, which we see through blood tests. Now, unfortunately, an EKG is not this simple. It is much more complicated. When you actually print out an EKG, it's gonna look a lot more like this. Now, what does this all mean? Well, let's talk about it. We talked about how the EKG has 12 leads, right? And these leads are going to be vectors, kind of electrical vectors. Now, I'm not an electrical engineer, so I'm not, you know, an expert on these vectors, but they're going to create planes. And they're pretty much, if you can think of these leads as a camera that's looking at the heart in a very specific manner. For MA purposes, you don't need to really completely understand everything, but I'm going to kind of hit on the highlights of the most important things. And the first thing is going to be this right here. This is called... Eindhoven's triangle and Eindhoven actually invented the EKG and Eindhoven actually invented the EKG if I'm not mistaken but anyway let's talk about Eindhoven's triangle so when you place the limb leads hopefully you remember what the limb, lead, the limb leads were it was the right arm the left arm the right leg and the left leg the right leg we don't actually use it it's not really useful it's more of a grounding thing and if you know about electricity, then you know about this whole grounding, which I'm not going to get into. But let's talk about the triangle itself. The triangle is going to have three sides, right? And these sides are going to be composed of lead one, lead two, and lead three. The corners are going to be composed of that right arm that we place, that left arm that we place, and then that left leg. So if we ask, what composes Eindhoven's triangle? It is not right arm, left arm, and left leg. No, it is lead one, lead two, and lead three. When we look at the 12 lead EKG, we see lead 1, lead 2, and lead 3, and we call these bipolar leads. So you could be asked, what are the bipolar leads? Well, you should know it is lead 1, lead 2, and lead 3, all in Roman numerals. We can also talk about AVR, AVO, and AVF, and these are unipolar leads. We're not going to get too, too bogged down into these, but just know that they are unipolar. And it is the AVR, AVO, and AVF. And now, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6, what we have talked about these, and hopefully you remember the name, and the name of these are precordial. So you could be asked, which of the following is a unipolar lead? Well, you should know AVL, AVR, AVF. You might be asked, what are the bipolar leads? What is uh, lead 1, lead 2, and lead 3? What are the precordials? V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. And just to test your memory, what is the exact location of where you're supposed to place V6? It's in the fifth intercostal space, left mid-axillary line. Make sure you know those. <clears throat> I include this image here just to kind of show you um, what an EKG looks like. But, you know, if you're not trained, you might not really know what you're looking at here. But this is actually a heart attack. Uh, we can see a couple of things here. So first of all, let's look at the gain. We can see it right here. Right. And if you count it, it should be 10 little squares. But then if we look right here, we see this in the... Um, leads 2, 3, and ABF, we see an elevation of that ST segment. So this person right here is actually having a heart attack. For testing purposes, you're not going to have to know what the ST segment looks like, but I just wanted to include it on there just to kind of show you. So here we see two different images of EKGs being placed uh, by two different people. Both of them are males. Um, but let's talk about a couple complications that could occur. One of them is going to be, you can see artifacts, and I'm going to talk about artifacts in a little bit. Now, another thing is that you might experience syncope on patients who have been recumbent, especially those that have been recumbent for a long time. What does that mean? Patients who have been laying down, okay? They stand up too quickly and then they could have a syncopal episode. What does syncope mean? It means passing out, right? Fainting. Now, some patients might have dyspnea and might not be able to lay flat. Dyspnea means trouble breathing. So that's something you might want to place them in the semifowlers or maybe even a Fowler's uh, to be able to do that EKG. And so semi-Fowler's might be one of your best um, bets. All right, artifacts. So earlier, I told you that the EKG, the line that the machine makes, right, called the isoelectric line, should be perpendicular to the bottom of the paper. Now, a somatic tremor can sometimes occur when the patient is moving, the patient is trembling, maybe he's cold. You get this sort of erratic baseline where you can't really tell what's the P. I mean, you can tell what the QRS is. You cannot tell what, where's the P, where's the T, 
just get all this. This is a bad EKG. You're going to have to redo it. How do we get rid of a somatic tremor? Ask the patient not to move. If the patient is shivering, give them a blanket. And those are the most basic sort of um, reasons to fix a somatic tremor. AC interference. This one you might also see referred to as electrical. Electrical interference. This could happen for several reasons. One, the patient has a cell phone on them that is vibrating. Um, they have a smart watch. Sometimes even if they're hooked up to another machine that is plugged into the electricity, let's say a, a, a monitor. Sometimes I've even seen it with uh, patients who are intubated and the machine is going off. Sometimes you see this very spiky, very quickly, almost machine-like uh, tremor on the baseline. And so this is how you know it's electrical interference, AC interference, or I think I've also heard it referred to as uh, 13 hertz interference. If anything has to do with electricity, this is it, a sort of machine-like uh, movement to the baseline. Now this is a wandering baseline. Again, remember the isoelectric line or the baseline is supposed to be nice and even to the bottom of the paper. Now this is probably one of the most common ones. And this usually happens because of the patient's breathing, sometimes movement, um, but usually breathing is the most common cause of this wandering baseline. And the, this is the hardest one to get rid of. Sometimes there's not much you can do because the patient obviously has to breathe, but I would say as long as it's not too bad, most doctors would be okay with this one. Here is a different um, artifact, and this is from the Pearson book. And so on this one, this is a broken recording where it was fine, fine, and all of, some, all of a sudden something happened. And usually this one is when one of the leads comes off or it is sort of loose. You might see this. So again, how do you get rid of these? Well, if it's a somatic tremor, you might want to offer a blanket. If it is a machine, you know, you want to try to make sure that the machine is disconnected, obviously making sure that it's not going to affect something else. Now let's talk about rhythms, very basic rhythms, nothing too, too hard. Well, first of all, we're going to have this rhythm, sinus bradycardia. Why is it sinus? So if there are P waves, it's going to be a sinus rhythm, bradycardia. What does that mean? Brady means slow, cardia means heart. So sinus bradycardia is going to be a slow heart. The heart rate should be between 60 to 100 beats per minute in an adult. Now you might see slight variations of this. You might see 80 to 100, 75 to 90, but 60 to 100 is usually the, the common number. So how do we know this one is slow? Well, so you need to know three rules in order to be able to determine the heart rate. The first rule is going to be called the 1500 rule. And this one is really not that hard. What you're going to do is you're going to use the R wave, and you're going to count from R to R. And you're going to count all the little squares from R to R. So I already told you that in one big square, you have five little squares, right? Big square, five little squares. 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 And then here we have, well, another five. So from R to R, we have 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. And all we're going to do is divide 1500 by 40, which equals 37.5 beats per minute, which is less than 60, so that is bradycardia. So again, for the 1500 rule, we are counting the little squares from R to R. Now, technically, you could also use the beginning of the P, the beginning of the T, you could use an S, you could use anything, but I prefer, I think the best thing is to use the R because it is nice and big and you can always see it. That is the 1500 rule. Now, another rule you need to know is the 300 rule. For this one, we're not going to use the, the little squares, we're going to use the big squares. So here we have one big square, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have eight big squares. So we're going to divide 300 by eight, which equals 37.5. And as you can see, it's the same as the 1500 rule, just a little bit different. Now, there is another rule called the six second rule. Um, and for this one, we need to go back to kind of what we were talking about earlier. We had said that the speed of the paper is supposed to be what? 25 millimeters. Per second, right? And we said 
that one big square equals 0.2 seconds. So how many squares, how many big squares are equivalent to one second? We said five. So one, two, three, four, five. So from here to here, it is one second. So how many of these squares do we need to have six seconds? Right? How many little, how many big squares do we need for six seconds if for one second we have five? Well, that means that another five, one, two, three, four, five, right here, this is two seconds. So then one, two, three, four, five, this is three seconds. One, two, three, four, five, this is four seconds. And then one, two, three, four, five, this would be five seconds. And then there would be another five, one, two, three, four, five. So this would be six seconds. And if we look at this pattern, I think we could safely assume that there would probably be another QRST somewhere around there. Okay, so for six seconds, you need to have 30 big squares. And let's assume that this were uh, 30 big squares. Now what we're going to do is we're going to count how many cardiac cycles are within these six seconds. And remember, cardiac cycle is a P, QRS, and a T. So we have one, two, three, four. All right, so we have four complete cardiac cycles. And now what we're going to do is multiply it times 10. And that equals 40 beats per minute. Why times 10? Because in 60 seconds, it's one minute. Right? And if here we have six seconds, well, we have to multiply six times 10 in order to get 60 seconds. And that is one minute. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm going to keep on saying these over and over again so that they stick. And so let's move on to the next one. So sinus tachycardia, what does sinus mean? It means that the, that the SA node is firing, so we're going to have P waves. We see P waves, yes, so we know it's a sinus rhythm. Tachycardia, tachy means fast, cardia means heart. This is a fast heart. What was the regular uh, heart rate? It is 60 to 100 beats per minute. So in order for it to be tacky, it has to be above 100. So 101, 102, 103, whatever. Well, how do we determine that? Well, let's use first the 1500 rule. And what do we have to do for the 1500 rule? Well, we're going to count how many little squares are between R and R. So we have an R right here and an R right here. And let's count the little squares. Well, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So there are 13 little squares. So what are we going to do now is divide 1500 by 13. And this equals 115.3 beats per minute. Is that faster than 100? Yes, so that is tacky. Now let's use the 300 rule. For this one, we're going to count the big squares, right? We know that one big square has five little squares. So here we have one, two, three, four, five. So that would be one big square. One, two, three, four, five. This would be two big squares. And then we have three little squares left over. So we have two big squares and then three little squares, okay? Now we are not, this is really important, we are not going to divide it by 2.3, which is what a lot of people would do. No. It gets a little bit more complicated. <clears throat> what we are going to do is we're going to talk about percentages. Again, this is a little confusing, but once you get the hang of it, it's really not that hard. So we know that from here to here is 100%, right? So then that means that each square is 20%, right? Which would equal 100%. So if we have three little squares filled out, we are filling up 60% of the big square, so we're going to divide by 2.6. 300 divided by 2.6, it is 115.3 beats per minute, which is the same thing that we got for the 1500. So a little bit more confusing, but really not that hard if you really understand that one big square equals 100%, each little square is 
20%. So however many you fill out is that percentage. So we only had one square, it'd be 20%, two, 40%, 360, 480, and then obviously all five would be 100%, which you would just count as a big box. Hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, just go back and rewatch it. Okay, sinus to rest. Sinus, we have P wave. Arrest means it stops. So right here, there should have been another heartbeat. Now there wasn't. And arrest means the heart stops. Uh, do not get arrest confused with myocardial infarction. An MI is a heart attack. Okay, and arrest means the heart stopped. They're not the exact same things. An MI, if it's big enough, can lead to an arrest. So just make sure you know that an MI, myocardial infarction, is heart attack and does not mean the heart stops. With an MI, uh, an artery is being blocked, right? One of the coronary arteries is being blocked so the heart is not getting the, the oxygen that it needs. So atrial flutter. An atrial flutter, what's happening is that the atria, the chambers that are supposed to be on top of the heart, are contracting four times faster than they're supposed to. So for every four contractions, of the atria, we're actually getting one contraction of the ventricles. Four contractions of the atria, one contraction of the ventricles, so on and so forth. I really don't think they're going to test you on this, but just know that a flutter is a very common type of arrhythmia. The next one is atrial fibrillation, also known as AFib. In AFib, what's happening is that, again, the atria, the ones on top, are quivering, basically. So we don't really see a P wave. There's really no P wave. All what's happening is they're quivering, they're shaking, so you don't see a P wave, but the ventricles are working fine, so we still see that QRS and T. We don't really see a P, but we do see a QRS and T. No P, QRS and T. That is an AFib. Ventricular fibrillation, also known as VFib. In this one, this was a very dangerous uh, arrhythmia because this one can kill you, and it can kill you fairly quickly. Because remember, the ventricles, the ones on the bottom, Specifically, the left ventricle will pump blood out into the brain and into the rest of the body. And if it's not pumping adequately, as what happens with ventricular fibrillation, um, no blood gets to the brain, to the organs, and you're going to die. So the ventricle is quivering, and we see all of this kind of just randomness of the ventricles. Uh, now, V-fib is a shockable rhythm. There's only two rhythms that would really shock. Now, this is more of an ACLS protocol type of deal but V-fib is a shockable rhythm. Here's another example of V-fib. Again, we see this kind of crazy wave line. The ventricles are quivering. They're not really pumping blood. This person is dying. Here we see VTAC, ventricular tachycardia. So in VTAC, the heart rate is going really, really fast and the ventricles are pumping so fast that not enough blood is getting inside of them. So if not enough blood is getting inside, then obviously not enough blood is going out. This is very dangerous. This could also kill you very quickly. And uh, this is, again, another shockable rhythm. Now, just kind of for funsies, let's figure out the heart rate in this one. So let's do the 1500 rule. We said that in order to get the 1500 rule, we have to count the little squares between R and R. So here, all of these are R's. All we see pretty much is the ventricles um, contracting when obtaining P waves because the ventricles are contracting so fast, so hard, that it completely masks anything else. And so let's count. So 1500, we need the little squares. So little squares, let's say that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So it is 7 little squares. And let's divide that, 1500 divided by 7, which equals 214 beats per minute. Very, very fast. If we use the 300 rule, we would use uh, the big squares, right? So if it's seven, then we know that that is one big square, right? Because we know that one big square has five little squares, and then we're gonna have two little squares left over. Now, are we gonna divide it by 1.2? No, remember, two squares would take up 40%, right? Because we talked about 20% for one, 40% for two, 60% for three, 80% for four. So two would take up 40%, so it is one point. Four. And again, this is obviously to 14 beats per minute. Now, if we use the six second rule, so the good thing is that these lines right here are already telling you that between these two lines, you have 15 squares, big squares. So then from these other two lines, you're going to have 15 squares. So we know that here we already have 30 squares. Now, what we're going to have to do is count the PQRS complexes, which is hard on this one because, well, there's none. 
uh, but we could just kind of count how many QRS complexes are going on. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, and I guess twenty-one. So we have twenty-one complexes, and we said we we're going to multiply that times ten, which equals two hundred and ten, which is kind of close to the 214 beats per minute. And that is how you figure out the heart rate in this case. Another very common um, rhythm you're gonna see is asystole. Let's break that one down. A in medical terminology means without. Systole means contraction. So asystole means without contraction, which is what you see here. You just see an isoelectric line that is almost completely parallel to the bottom of the paper. And that is because there's no electrical activity. So this is when you hear that machine go beep. Right? This is not a shock rhythm. Despite what you see in the movies, you do not shock a systole. You cannot get something that's dead back to life. So a systole is a non shockable rhythm. Premature ventricular contractions, also known as PVCs. Uh, what's happening here is that the ventricle is going to contract uh, sooner than it's supposed to, right? So normal is supposed to be P, QRS, and T, right? P, QRS, and T. P, QRS, and T. P, QRS, and T. What happens with the PVC is that all of a sudden the ventricle contracts again. There is no, this is a T, it's not a P. There is no P wave before it. It just contracts randomly. And that's what a PVC is. And sometimes you might feel them. They're very, very common. I know I feel them myself. And you just kind of feel this kind of weird flutter. Sometimes you feel like your heart skips a beat. And that is basically what a PVC is. All right, and last but not least, let's talk about a normal sinus rhythm. So obviously the heart rate has to be between 60 and 100 beats per minute, correct? So let's use the 1500 rule. We know that for the 1500 rule, we have to count the little squares. So we know that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. So there are 25 little squares. So we're going to divide 1,500 divided by 25, and that equals 60, just barely. If we use the 300 rule, we're going to count the big squares. And we know that that'll be one big square, two, three, four, five big squares. And that would also equal 60 beats per minute. And if we use the six second rule, we know that they're supposed to be 30 squares, right? So let's see. One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine. And let's assume there's another one. So if this were to actually be here, this one would probably finish, and then there would probably be at least one more um, EKG here. So we would have one, two three, four, five, and six. So we would have six complete cardiac cycles, which would multiply times 10, right? Because six times 10 equals 60 seconds. One minute has 60 seconds. And so this would be 60 beats per minute. And as you can see, the more and more you do these exercises with the 1500, the 300, and the six second rule, the easier and the quicker you can just do these. Okay, now let's talk about stress testing. Stress testing is a test. It's basically an EKG that's going to be done while the patient is under stress. And there's different types. There could be a treadmill, which is the most common one. There's bicycle ones. And then there's others that are also done through drugs where the patient cannot walk, where they give them some drugs, and it kind of mimics them doing exercise. The usual reason for these are patients who have angina. And angina is chest pain. And the patients who usually get this test are those we get chest pains when they uh, exercise or when they walk for a long period of time, they get a little bit of chest pain, which could be early signs of a heart attack, so they get this uh, stress test done. Um, after the exercise, they're usually put through a, um, an MRI machine and they're injected thallium, which is a dye. And through that dye, you can see kind of what sections of the heart are not receiving the adequate amount of oxygen. And that's pretty much what a stress test is. Our Holter monitor or event monitor, if you think about it, when you take an EKG, you're taking a picture, and it only happens right there and then. So if a patient is experiencing, let's say, an arrhythmia, they're experiencing um, 
sort of a fluttering of your chest. Well, unless you take an EKG at that exact moment, you're not going to tell much, right? So with a Holter monitor, they wear this machine for 24 hours, 48 hours. Um, the electrodes are placed at the office. The patient is not supposed to take them off. They're not supposed to shower with the machine. If electrode comes off, you're just supposed to kind of apply some tape on it so it doesn't fall off. Um, <clears throat> and then they just wear it, right? Whenever they do feel something weird on their chest, they do press a button so that the doctor knows. The doctor's going to review all of this at some point so that the doctor knows at what moment they felt something weird. And they're also supposed to keep a diary so that, let's say, they were in a car wreck, right? Obviously, when the car wreck happens, uh, the heart rate's going to go up. So then they would write it on a diary at 3.30 p.m., you know, I was in a car wreck. So then when the doctor reviews it and he sees that there's a spike in the, um, in the heart rate, well, he knows why. There was a reason for it. And that's pretty much what a Holter monitor is. There is another alternative called a loop recorder. Um, and that is a, something a little bit more permanent. It lasts for a couple months. And it's, it's kind of through surgery, a little procedure, and they put it under the skin. So we talked about the EKG. I didn't go too much into detail. I kind of just wanted to discuss what was in the book. Make sure you know that you're as complex. Make sure you know your, your 1500, 300, and, um, and six second rule. Make sure you know the different types of artifacts and how to fix them. And just kind of the basics of making sure you get uh, to identifiers, introduce yourself, uh, make sure the patient feels comfortable. If you get this down, I'm pretty sure you're gonna do pretty well on the test. Uh, good luck. And if you have any questions, you know, just leave a comment and I'll get back to it. Thank you for sticking around.